Good morning, Austin, and welcome to the Atheist Experience. My name is Ray Blevins, my co-host Jeff D, and this week's guest, Don Rhodes. He happens to be the co-chairperson of Atheist Community of Austin. And uh, this show is brought to you by Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, this is live April 18th. We'll be taking your phone calls. That's our number right there. Uh, <clears throat> we always start off with a little bit of news here about Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, we meet every Sunday down at the Hot Jumble Bakery. Once we get done here, we head right down there. And today, it's kind of hard to read, but uh, today when we get done uh, with our general meeting, we're going to go to the walk to raise money for Safe Place. That's what this little poster is down there. It, and Don will be giving us, well, I'll let Don talk more about that. But uh, I'm thinking that's really all the news for the group is our meeting and the, uh, things. Uh, things are definitely going well with the group. Uh, uh, we'll be doing our yearly elections here. Just to remind uh, all, all the viewers that are members of ACA, uh, our normal uh, first Sunday of the month is our lecture series. Well, this Sunday is our yearly election. So we will be meeting at FERS at North Cross Mall, but it won't be a lecture. It'll just be the election. We'll, uh, we'll do the nominations and the votes and everything right then that Sunday. So it gives me a good chance to remind all of the members that uh, your votes matter to us. So we'd definitely like for you to come out and vote and maybe even run for an office there. We like. So uh, at this point, I guess I'll pass it over to Jeff. You got, you got some news from the... Yeah, I got some news items. Um, good morning, folks. Uh, boy, let's see. Several things to talk about today. ACLU sues public schools military over sponsorship of Boy Scouts. Schools, military bases, and other publicly funded groups have no business sponsoring Boy Scout troops so long as Scouts are required to take a religious oath, the American Civil Liberties Union says. In a federal lawsuit filed Wednesday, the ACLU argues that public funding of Boy Scouts of America troops violates the constitutional requirement of separation of church and state. Government agencies simply cannot spend tax dollars on programs that exclude people because of their religious beliefs, ACLU attorney Roger Leishman said. The suit, filed on behalf of five taxpayers, names as defendants the Chicago Public Schools and the United States Transportation Command, headquartered at Scott Air Force Base in southern Illinois. Leishman said the two defendants represent any local agency in Illinois that receives state funding and all federal agencies. He did not know how many schools in Illinois sponsor troops. Quote, there is no allegation that any individual student or leader has suffered any kind of discrimination based on religion in connection with any program sponsored by the Chicago Public Schools, unquote, said Robert Hall, first assistant attorney with the Chicago Public Schools system. The Boy Scouts of America also said the lawsuit is without merit. Quote, it is regrettable that the ACLU would seek to deny these boys access to the scouting program simply because they promised to do their duty to God, unquote, national spokesman Greg Shields said. This response entirely misses the point. Any boy who wants to can promise to do his duty to God with or without state and federal funds being used to sponsor the Boy Scouts. This is a, uh, is a challenge against unconstitutional state sponsorship of a particular religion, not an attack on individual uh, religious freedoms, even though that's the way the Boy Scouts are trying to play it. Uh, the ACLU has been a longtime critic of the Boy Scouts. Last year, it sued the city of Chicago over the organization's oath, as well as its ban on gay members. The city, which had sponsored troops, ended its affiliation with the organization. Vatican says Rwanda bishop arrest wounds Catholics. Augustin Misago, a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, was arrested in Rwanda Wednesday on charges of genocide. Rwandan officials said the 56-year-old bishop had been seeking refuge at the residence of the Pope's envoy in Kigali, where he was arrested. The Vatican responded by saying it was pained by the arrest, describing Bishop Masago's detention as an extremely serious act, wounding the entire Roman Catholic Church. Chief Vatican spokesman Joachim Navarro Valls said the Holy See deeply regretted the uh, arrest. Quote, the arrest of a bishop is an extremely grave act which wounds not only the church in Rwanda, but the whole of the Roman Catholic Church, he said in a strong, uh, strongly worded statement. Relations between the Republic of Rwanda and the Holy See are profoundly troubled by this. 
London-based human rights group Africa Watch last year accused the Catholic Church of protecting clergy suspected of complicity in the 1994 slaughter of some 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus by uh, harboring some in European uh, countries or moving them to parishes in other African nations. Quote, there is compelling evidence that a number of bishops, priests, nuns, and brothers were either complicit in genocide or directly participated in it, unquote. Africa Watch said last May in a statement which accompanied an open letter to Pope John Paul. Given the scale and consistency of the accusations, the reluctance of the Catholic Church to act upon them is regrettable, it added, calling on the Pope to set up an inquiry into the charges. Um, at a service in Rwanda last week to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the geno genocide, survivors called for the arrest of Misago for his alleged role as a planner and instigator of the killing of more than 150,000 Tutsis in his diocese of Kigangoro, 100 kilometers south of Kigali. Navarro Valles said he uh, said it was hoped that Rwanda would afford all legal guarantees to the bishop and that his innocence would be quickly confirmed. Despite bitter accusations against the bishop over the last five years, the Catholic Church has never attempted to move him from his post in Rwanda. About 30 Roman Catholic clergy are currently detained in Rwandan prisons and death sentences handed down to two priests. And this is so entirely in keeping with the Catholic Church's behavior when their own people get accused. Exactly. They, they don't even begin to address the issue of whether the accusations are true. Um, they, they, they do not offer any support for uh, following through on the legal process to find out if their people have committed crimes. They immediately start in uh, threatening the governments that have arrested their people uh, uh, and, and you know, acting as if, as if this is some sort of attack against Catholicism, which, uh, you know, I think if there's going to be an attack against Catholicism, it ought to be on the basis of the way the Catholic Church uh, reacts when its own people get accused. Um, uh, I'm glad you read that article instead of me. Some of those <laughs> names there, <laughs> you, you did a fine job. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Dan Quayle has officially announced that he's going to run for president. Oh, no. I have no further comment. <laughs> Out of this world discovery, astronomers have discovered the first solar system other than our own. It has three planets orbiting a star that is 44 light years away. I heard about this. This is good. Yeah. The d discovery of a group of planets orbiting a sun like our own will cause great excitement and raises the chances that there may be other forms of life in the universe. Quote, it is one of the most important astronomical discoveries for decades, said Professor Jeff Marcy, one of the discoverers of the system. Um, the star concerned is called Upsilon Andromedae. Although it is 44 light years from Earth, it is easily visible to the unaided eye in the night sky. And I haven't gone to the trouble of trying to pick it out yet, but I, I plan on uh, well, hunting it down. Because uh, it's control. like historical. I wonder uh, if Vic hey, has. Arlo? Yeah. No, uh, Vic, uh, oh. uh, Vic is our astronomer in the group. And I uh, wanted we'll to see if he can help us point. Because uh, supposedly this star is visible with the naked eye, and you'll have to help us point this out. another. Upsilon Andromedae, the one with the planets that they discovered? The multiple planets? Okay, but uh, we have to do more research on that. Maybe we can bring in a picture or something. Okay. Yes. In 1996, astronomers Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler of San Francisco University detected evidence that a planet about the same mass as Jupiter was circling the star. Now they have discovered that two other planets are also orbiting Upsilon Andromedae. Excuse me. I'm going to sneeze here in a second, and I apologize in advance. Uh, <laughs> astronomers for the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Massachusetts have also made observations of the star and confirmed the findings. The discovery is a momentous one. It offers the first evidence that solar systems like our own could be commonplace in our galaxy. Yeah. We're getting sound from the yes. headsets out in the studio. Until now, astronomers had detected many Jupiter-sized planets orbiting nearby solar-type stars, but not a solar system. Quote, it implies that planets can form more easily than we ever imagined and that our Milky Way is teeming with planetary systems, unquote, said Dr. Deborah Fisher of FS, excuse me, SFSU. The innermost of the three planets circles Epsilon and only about 8 million kilometers from its surface. Its year would be only 4.6 days. Although the planet is estimated to be about the mass of Jupiter, it must be a completely different world. Being so close to its parent star, it must be very hot on its starward side. Its other side may always look away from the sun and may be very cold. Huge storms would rack the planet as heat passed around the world. 
The other two planets are thought to be somewhat larger. One would have a mass of about two Jupiters and take 242 days to circle Epsilon in an oval orbit about 129 kilometers from the star. Excuse me, 129 million kilometers from the star. <laughs> the third planet is even more massive, about four times the mass of Jupiter. It is even farther away at 400 million kilometers. It takes about four years to orbit. No current theory of planetary formation predicted that so many giant worlds could form around a star. This will shake up the theory of planetary formation, said Robert Noyes, professor of astronomy at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The research data will be published in the Astrophysical Journal in July. That's fantastic. And again, for those of you who wonder what this has to do with atheism, uh, the more it appears that the universe naturally contains conditions for life to develop on its own, the more that supports evolution and, and tends to uh, not support the presence of some divine creator. So, since we're talking space, Don, do you mind if I go ahead and get no, this go first? ahead. <laughs> <laughs> More space news. So we, I did bring in some news here, and I, I don't know which camera. I want to show them three, try three. Yeah, there you go. Message from God. <laughs> yes, NASA radio telescope picks up mysterious transmission from deep space. And I guess along with that message, there was a picture, because this is what <laughs> their interpretation of what God looks like. Now, at the risk of offending some of our viewers uh, by, by suggesting that any of them might be foolish enough to believe a story in the Weekly World News, we should point out that that story is in the Weekly World News, a tabloid which is not well known for its uh, um, uh, journalistic integrity. So it, uh, just a few highlights of the story. I'm not going to read the whole story, but it, uh, if there's any Christians out there, I'd like to hear if they're skeptical of a message through NASA that God would actually send a message through NASA to get to the Christians. I'm real curious That's about that. That's been done before. Oh, has it? Uh, yes. Fill us in there, Arlo. Well, in Carl Sagan's book, A Demon Haunted World, he talked about oh. that. There was this uh, people claiming that the government had a cover-up, that they were receiving uh, voices coming from the center of the galaxy, singing, Glory be to God. <laughs> in English, of course. <laughs> I thought that was another uh, Weekly World News article. Uh, probably was. <laughs> it probably was. I'm sure if they heard about it, they'd have published it. Okay, and uh, it, it go, the article tries to sound official, saying theoretically any signal measuring less than 300 megahertz couldn't occur naturally. And uh, I haven't done the research to find out if that's true or not. So it, uh, it says it would have to be artificially produced. On, at 2 a.m. on February 11, 1997, I love the idea that it occurred on my birthday. Was that your birthday? <laughs> That's my birthday, yes. They got the message from God on my birthday. And, uh, <laughs> and a telescope in California picked up a signal measuring 150 megahertz. And that, uh, go ahead, Arlo, do you know something? Well, I just want to say, first of all, if you check up on it and you do realize that at that frequency it has to be man-made, you also got to accept the possibility that they might just be lying. <laughs> <laughs> But it uh, says, when analyzed, it was found to be a series of high-low staccato pulses similar to Morse code. The pulses corresponded to a series of numbers beginning with 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0 and continued for a total of 150,000 figures. Obviously, it was some kind of binary code. And <laughs> thank you, Arlo. And the first few thousand numbers uh, were devoted to teaching the language. Uh, uh, the, uh, teaching the language to the recipient of the message. Excited government scientists went about methodically decoding the message. Just weeks ago, two years after relentless effort, NASA cryptographers succeeded in translating the message. And basically, here's what uh, I'm trying to find exactly what the message says. I think uh, this is supposed to be it. Right okay. The days of Earth are numbered. Spread these words so many can prepare. For out of the fire will come paradise, and the righteous shall prosper and become the seeds of the new millennium. So it, uh, they're trying to tie in the millennium and everything, all in this one little article here. And, uh, but uh, I just thought to get a kick out of that. Did they actually have a picture of God? That's what they're... And we have a message from God. So I'd like to hear the Christians what they think about this message from God. Uh, we are live April 18th. Just to remind everyone... And I guess we have a picture of... Uh, no, Vic brought me a, 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 a separate story um, about a possible discovery of a, uh, of a planet orbiting another sun that, where the planet is roughly the size of the Earth instead of Jupiter-sized. Uh, the story I read before, the way they detect planets that big is by measuring 
a wobble in the star they're looking at because exactly. because big planets, Jupiter-sized planets, will actually pull the sun that they're orbiting, you know, slightly, and they can detect that, and that's how they determine how big the planet is that's doing the pulling and how far out it's orbiting and what its or period of orbit is, and so on. Here, there's a story that by detecting a slight uh, increase in the brightness of a particular star, uh, they have they have tentatively uh, theorized that what happened was they were picking up light reflected from an Earth-sized planet orbiting that star. As it like came out from the backside, it would reflect right. light that was going away toward us, and then we'd have a chance of seeing it. Um, so I'm not going to read this whole story because it's long and I'm not prepared for it, but. Uh, but that's cool too. Yeah, so they're finding planets. That's the important thing. They're finding planets more and more now. Now that our our uh, detection capabilities are have increased. Actually, if go ahead, if I may mention at the uh, American Astronomical uh, Society convention, uh, they were speaking of many projects of setting up satellites, like an array of five satellites in the year 2010, which is. The, the only point of them being up there is to find terrestrial planets near the size of Earth. So if we're doing this much before we're putting this stuff up there, that's really exciting. Yeah. Also talking about satellites that may even be able to detect ozone on a terrestrial planet, which would be a great uh, step towards finding life. Fantastic. Cool. Uh, and uh, just remind everyone uh, that artwork you're seeing in the background is from our sound guy, Arlo Pignati. He had, uh, yes, he, had, uh, he, he does the artwork. Are those Earth-sized planets we're seeing there? Right? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm surprised you put that one up there. That was just that was the first thing I ever did on Airbrush. I was really? just messing around. <laughs> it turned out great. But the the Earth is looking less and less special all the time, and uh, that's yeah. uh, that is a big indication that we are not the focus of some kind of some kind of intelligent creator who made us specially. All right, and uh, we are live April 18th. We'll be taking your phone calls. Uh, I'd like to go to Don there, and uh, you want to fill us in on a little bit about the convention. Uh, yes. Uh, we had a great convention. Yeah. It, it Mary was, Sue did a great job. I want to thank her again. And, uh, we had a lot of fun. It was, it was very uh, interesting, entertaining. Uh, a lot of folks are telling me they really enjoyed meeting these people from across the country, uh, the movers and shakers of a lot of different uh, atheist groups. The convention was called the 1999 Free Thought Roundup. It was the fifth annual convention of the Atheist Alliance. The Atheist Alliance is a collection uh, or a uh, confederation of, uh, I believe, 18 local autonomous uh, democratic atheist organizations ranging in size from a few dozen members to hundreds. Uh, they meet once a year on Easter weekend, uh, have a board meeting to discuss business and then listen to speakers, have some workshops and have some fun. And on Friday we got the most of the board business out of the way. The board decided to drop the dues requirements for, uh, for, for belonging to the Alliance and uh, the, the thinking is that that's going to bring a lot of the smaller poorer groups into the into the umbrella of the alliance so that we can act better, uh, more coordination between uh, local groups, because local groups is what the alliance is all about. On Friday night, we had a blast. We had a hundred atheists, roughly a hundred atheists go together to Esther's Follies, yes. and, uh, and it was an absolute hoot. It was, uh, it was a blast. Uh, everyone that uh, that I talked to about it afterwards said that they were just absolutely delighted uh, that we were able to make that happen. And of course, the convention is was in the Omni Hotel, so it was just a few blocks. So most people just walked over there, uh, and that was great. It was my first trip to Esther's Follies, and uh, and I'll be going again. It was it was good, and uh, they made a couple of uh, uh, comments. They had several skits that were kind of oriented. Uh, towards uh, religion or, or atheism and, and no, no one was uh, offended. Everyone went away real happy. Uh, Saturday morning we introduced the different groups present, those involved with the Alliance and those that weren't. And then our first speaker was Adam Butler. Adam Butler was the Freedom From Religion Foundation's Student Activist of the Year last year. And uh, he put on a pretty exciting uh, program. He's a, a young student at the University of Alabama in Montgomery. and uh, he's been involved with uh, several free thought groups there, and they had a sign that they were allowed to put on the on the steps of the the Capitol 
And he, he told a real interesting story about how the, the sign kept getting stolen, so they kept constructing larger and larger, more difficult to uh, mess with signs. And he had a slide presentation, and that was, that was real good. He's, a, he's an excellent speaker and very, very funny. What, uh, did, what did the sign say? Just to uh, it, was a, it was a counterpoint to a, uh, a crash on the steps of the Capitol. They, were, they had a crash uh, uh, manger scene oh. on one side, and then on the other side, they had been allowed to put up. Uh, I, I'm not sure the exact wording of the sign. I, I should know that. He had a picture of it. But it was something to the effect that uh, uh, the solstice was a reason for the season or, or something like that. Now, there's. Oh, I see. I, 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 I'll just have to plead ignorance. So I don't, I don't okay. really know. But it was something to the point of that, uh, that religion wasn't true. Cool. Uh, so, so of course, in Alabama, this is uh, offensive to a lot of people that don't want there to be people that disagree. I mean, uh, everybody's got to be religious, right? You just pick one. <laughs> so uh, that was that was real interesting listening to him. He he's got some great stories, and and with the intensity of. Uh, uh, religious feeling in Alabama. To me, it would be frightening to be yes. uh, openly atheist in Alabama. But they have a very active and uh, 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 a, a group that you know they've got a lot going on. There's a lot of neat things happening there. They have a uh, like a little atheist resort thing on a lake. It's and they you know, have a July Fourth thing there every uh, every year. It's 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 really uh, pretty interesting. Uh, Dr. Arthur Ide spoke to us after Adam Butler. He is the author of something like 400 titles. Uh, yeah, I've always thought it'd be neat to write a book, but can you imagine writing a book and then not being able to stop? Yeah. Just <laughs> writing books all the time. Uh, he is a, a scholar. Uh, he uh, certainly knows a great deal, and he spoke to us about preachers, pastors, popes, and other parasites, the lack of <laughs> biblical validity in holy orders and religion. Uh, and he had a lot to say. That was very good. Uh, after, after him, we had uh, several different things going on. We had a presentation about Camp Quest, which is a summer camp for children of non-theist parents. And this is something that uh, secular humanists have been putting together. Uh, and organizing, but people from a lot of different groups and philosophies are, are joining in. Uh, this is a great idea. And yes. it, they, had, uh, they had a slideshow, a lot of pictures of the camp. Adam Butler is one of their counselors. Uh, and that looks very interesting. That was very good. We also had a, uh, a presentation on, on Robert's Rules of Order for, for small groups. Uh, we could probably use that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but to, to help people uh, run meetings in, in small organizations. And then Mike Sullivan, who many people saw on our show a few weeks ago from the North Texas Church of Free Thought, uh, gave a presentation on a church for atheists. Uh, after lunch, uh, Ben Ackerley, who is the author of uh, uh, X-Rated Bible, uh, which is, let me just read off of it here, the, An Irreverent Survey of Sex in the Scriptures. And this is a re-release of a book that was uh, uh, published years ago. And it's got new artwork, and it's uh, spiffed up, and it's got a new publisher. And it looks real good. And Ben gave us a, a real good talk on the Bible in the bedroom. And he talked about a lot of different ways that religion has uh, affects our lives now in ways that are not so positive. Uh, homophobia was one that, uh, that kind of stuck out there. Uh, let's see. After that, we had uh, uh, Douglas Kruger, who wrote one of my favorite books of all time, uh, uh, What is Atheism? This is just an excellent uh, well-organized, well-thought-out uh, construction of, of atheist thought. And it's broken down in outline form. It's, uh, it's got a lot of uh, questions that we hear all the time on the show, like how can atheists have morals? And he breaks that down into uh, whether theism really supports morality and different moral systems that uh, don't require theism. Uh, and uh, and takes all kinds of different questions that are that are very common and and breaks them down very organized very easy to understand. He gave us a talk on the atheist attitude and talked about being upfront with uh, uh, your atheism and not keeping it uh, hidden. Be open about it. Uh, it's it's good. It's good. It makes you, it helps you feel good about yourself. 
and uh, he gave folks a lot of ammunition for that. Dr. Fred Whitehead from the University of Kansas talked about free thought in Texas history. Had a nice slideshow about a lot of uh, free thought sites and uh, an amazing uh, number of uh, free thought items in Texas history uh, that I, I didn't know about. Uh, we also had John Kuntz, who is a uh, member of our group, who teaches in a nearby school dist district, talking about te teaching evolution in a hostile environment, and that was very well received. Later on, we had a presentation from a, a group called OABITAR Obatar, which is Objectivity, Accuracy, and Balance in Teaching About Religion. Uh, the title of their, their presentation was Different Drummer, and they uh, presented, their, they have developed materials to help uh, teach about uh, free thought in school. Now, why, why, would that, uh, uh, why would that come up? Why do you need to teach about free thought in school? Well, some states are passing laws that requiring courses that teach about religion. So they, they, they cover uh, different subjects. They're supposed to be even-handed. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how that is, but uh, religion is part of culture, so uh, kids in some places are learning about it in school, and this is a way to present the uh, atheist and free thought point of view in that. And we also had a, a dramatic reading of a Harlan Ellison novelette called Deathbird. And then Saturday night uh, uh, is a lot of fun. We had uh, Dan Barker, who is the uh, uh, public relations director from the Freedom From Religion Foundation, an author of this book and several others, came in and spoke to us about evangelistic atheism, leading believers astray, and, and he also sang to us. Now, I've, I've had several people say that they really enjoyed the talk that he gave and they wish that he would have talked longer. He talked about how uh, he, he was a minister and realized that he was really an atheist. He did not believe the stuff that he was preaching and how bad he felt as he was giving sermons that he didn't believe. And people were coming up and, you know, getting saved and all this and, and he didn't believe it and didn't believe it was true. And he talked about how he made the change, how he, he told everybody in a, in a frank and positive way that he was not a believer anymore. And he spoke about how, how many of those people, family and friends, are now atheists as well. And he, he, he encouraged us to, uh, in a positive way, uh, to, to kind of, uh, I don't know, be a missionary, be a, uh, to evangelize a little bit. Uh, he didn't tell us to go knocking door to door and stuff. But he, but he also said, uh, you know, spread the word, talk it up. Uh, it's, uh, it's good and it's true. On Sunday morning, uh, Dr. Whitehead gave us another talk this time on free thinkers in the Union Army, there was an awful lot of stuff uh, from people that were uh, non-religious going on about the time of the Civil War. So he had a lot of a lot of good stuff to give us. Ray Romano, uh, not the Ray Romano, but our Ray Romano, <laughs> uh, gave us a dramatic presentation of the War Prayer, and uh, West Virginia newspaper editor James Hot spoke about the trillion dollar fraud. Uh, then after a short break, we had a panel discussion uh, on positive atheism, and then after that, the board meeting wrapped up. All in all, it was, uh, it was quite an experience. I know it was a, uh, a very tense experience for those of us that, uh, that put it together, but, uh, but it came off. Uh, uh, after the convention was all over, some of us took a bus ride to Comfort to to view right. the big rock and the True to Union monument, and that was a perfect way to wrap it up. Just relax on a bus. Uh, we watched the uh, Solstice Show tape on the bus. <laughs> Everybody enjoyed that. That's so cool. it was it was a good experience. It's always fun to be around a bunch of atheists, and you know it's part of why we part of why we do the the group and the show and everything. But to get a whole bunch of them from all over the country is really rewarding. Yeah, and with atheist community of Austin was definitely proud to do that. It uh, definitely showed Austin off real well. And from what I understand, Sacramento next year? Next year is Sacramento, California. Uh, and I got a visitor's guide from uh, Sacramento. And that looks like a lot of fun. There's a lot of stuff to do right around there. Uh, we're, we're already talking about maybe going there and, and uh, uh, maybe going to Lake, Lake Tahoe and seeing some of the sites right around there before the convention. But it's going to be a lot of fun. Sounds great. And, uh, 
All right, uh, this is live April 18th. We are taking your phone calls, and uh, I guess we have Bob on the line. Let's see. Bob? Yeah, I'm Bob. Good morning. How you doing? Fantastic. Uh, do I need my mute on the TV on, or that how do I listen yeah. to you guys? Yeah, turn. What? Can you hear us over the phone? I don't think so. Uh, well, uh, no, then leave your TV up then in that case. I'm sorry, we don't. Uh, we I have understand. To, we have to fine tune everything every week when we come in here. So sorry I about understand. that. Well, I hadn't been watching your show long, and I'm not familiar with uh, uh, exactly what y'all uh, are saying. I uh, I did notice you seem to uh, express a certain amount of unity among atheists that uh, uh, I haven't experienced. I, I don't. Um, I question the the. Uh, I mean, I believe that, that there are a lot of people who uh, would call themselves atheists that, uh, and I'm sure y'all would like to change this that aren't united in a lot of ways on their beliefs. Um, I, I noticed something was said about evolution, and uh, I questioned the uh, uh, the hypothesis that every time someone speaks of evolution, it, uh, it always excludes the idea of God. And anyone, anytime uh, people speak about God, it's always the idea of there is no evolution. In other words, God and evolution can't exist together. Uh, uh, okay, L let me. Let me can I address that? Sure. You know, that that is. Uh, it's commonly spoken of that way, but there there is plenty of room for uh, religious people that that uh, that want to believe in God and accept evolution as fact. I mean, there there's no. Uh, the, the, I, let me tell you this: the the people that that are wanting to say that evolution is impossible are the same. Pe are, what the, the re, what's leading them to that is the fact that they want to say that the Bible is is totally true. So that when it says in the Bible that the Earth was created in six days, then that must mean six days. Right. For for uh, for lots of uh, religious people, evolution happened and and God played a role in it. Right. Well, let me say this: I'm, I'm uh, was raised in a religion in a in a Baptist uh, background, and uh, the truth is, no one in in the Christian circles takes the Bible 100 percent literally. No. There are a lot of people who talk about it that way, no, but what they do is pick and choose because the there's for instance, quite a few, there's for, quite a few religions out there that'll tell you the Bible is in error. That's right, but they say that, but then they don't live that. For instance, when they look at the book of Revelation, Revelations, no, they don't have any problem saying that, oh, the fire falling from the sky is actually symbolic for nuclear holocaust. Right. It's only right. when they look at the book of Genesis, they can't see the whole story of Genesis is a story about evolution. You know, it's about the progression. It's about yesterday, uh, the past, the present, and the future. But, it's but a three-part story. But aren't you now doing the same thing with Genesis that the people you were just criticizing do with Revelations? I don't criticize. Uh, I think the Bible is full of metaphors and full of symbolism, and that's the only way to approach it. When you try to say it, it only says this, and it only means this, and it can't have any kind of meaning other than a literal interpretation, you do the Bible and any book, for that matter, a grave injustice. And, uh, okay. Well, we we of course don't do that, you know. We're, well, no, we're I'm not, not, we're not you Bible literalists. Um, and as as long as you want to, as long as people want to go on believing in a an omnipotent omnipotent being that has some reason not to reveal himself in a a plainly obvious way, uh, nobody's ever going to be able to disprove that, you know, in the in the sense of. It, scouring the entire universe and finding no such thing anywhere. Okay, right? Because because if you imagine that there's such a thing out there, you can easily imagine ways that it could go on existing, and we'd never be able to see it if we tried. Well, okay. so then, you so made, that, you brought up a good point there in that uh, the whole thing of the existence of God becomes a uh, a uh, matter of semantics because you're no. speaking you're speaking you're saying you don't believe in this God obviously, but you're speaking of someone else's God that you don't believe in. You see what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, you, you yeah. said he, for instance, and you said an omnipotent being. Right. And there's all these preconceived ideas about what God has to be. You know, you people obviously have morals. You've talked about morals. And right. if, if uh, for instance, my own uh, expanding view of what a God could be, just those morals themselves could be seen as a God. Just the unity between you people could be seen as a God. And we're nothing more than messengers of each other. Uh, messengers to each other of this higher um, way or this higher uh, higher ideals, you know, and 
But I, I'm not really calling up to argue about whether or not there's a God. I just want to make that point about it becomes a matter of semantics and what is God. And uh, can it be things other than this male omnipotent being that lives out in space or whatever? <laughs> and uh, we, we leave the definition up. Uh, here's a great quote from Carl Sagan there, yes. <clears throat> if you can read it. It is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in the delusion, however satisfying and re reassuring. Well, yeah. I have trouble with that quote because it seems to be taken out of context. Out of what context? Well, I mean, it doesn't, I don't know what he's talking about. Oh. Well, he's talking about the fact that... Um, well, I have to take people, your word for people, it because it's not even a complete sentence. Well, I know what he was talking about. I know uh, well, I have to trust wrong, you on I can, that. I can respond to that if you're interested. Go ahead. Um, uh, Carl Sagan was... Uh, uh, had basically, uh, it was basically talking about the fact that when you have something, uh, when you have a belief like God is X and X is something you can't prove it isn't God, right? Right. Um, and that then that could be anything. I'm trying to be real open here and not not pigeonhole God. Uh, and it, it, if there is no positive evidence of the existence of that thing as a God in some meaningful sense and people are just believing in that thing as a god, then what they're doing is they're believing in stuff that they have no, they have no reason to believe in other than their, their own sense of, uh, of happiness or gratification or comfort or whatever it is they derive from that belief. And Carl Sagan's point is that it is better to face the world as it really appears to be, only believe in stuff that it's plainly obvious that that stuff actually exists right. rather than rather than uh, it, it just gratify yourself by believing in anything that seems to be uh, uh, nice to believe in. Well, let me say this, you just ch you said when you were quoting Carl Sagan, he said the universe as it really is. But then when you reset it, you said as it appears to be. You know, 150 years ago, there didn't appear to be radio waves that could send television signals and on the other side of the earth. So in other words, what it appears to be, it seems to me that there is an but assumption but that our appear yeah. what we have as appearances is some kind of ultimate truth. That, uh, all, uh, you know, and truth and appearances and are changing. Sure, it's the evolution that we're talking about. We, we're going through a, a spiritual and, or if you don't want to believe in spiritual, you could call it a mental, uh, intellectual uh, revolution, revelation. I, I think I can respond to this. And, uh, yeah, and um, Bob, if you, if you don't mind, I'm not trying to be rude. i got a bunch of other callers. So well, let me say right. one other thing, all and then y'all yeah, can, can talk about me after I get off the phone, okay, and talk uh, about what a dumbass I am. <laughs> but, uh, we're not going to do that. Well, let me tell you this. Well, those, those Christian talk show hosts do. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, we do, we're not them. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, Mark Twain. I quest. Y'all were quoting Mark Twain and talking about the war prayer. Yeah. Yes. And I don't know of anywhere. I know that atheists have have risen the have held up the banner of Mark Twain ever since he died and said he's an atheist. I have a lot of problems with that. I believe he had a lot of. He was very anti-religion and he had a lot of trouble with religion. But just the fact that he pointed out the hypocrisy within religion showed me that you know. I mean, he had a, a sense of of more of moral. Um, I mean, he had morals, obviously, and I just I've never heard him say himself, "I don't believe in this or that." I've heard okay. him make fun of the Bible. You know, I've read the uh, what's the what's the story about uh, the letters from Earth. Right. Right. Oh, that's beautiful, man. But I, you know, to me, a lot of people can read that and say, "Well, he's an atheist." But but I don't feel that way. I feel okay. just because you question other people's interpretation of the Bible doesn't mean you you're yourself uh, rejecting the whole idea of. Um, of a God. Okay, we got a couple of things to respond to there. Can right. we, I'm gonna get off the line. Okay. I'll talk to y'all later. I appreciate Bob, it. thanks for your call. Thanks yeah, for your call. Week there, Bob. You brought up some good Mark points. Thing? Uh, well, you were you were first. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to sure. respond to the comment about uh, the uh, the perceived disparity between uh, talking about the universe as it is and the universe as it appears to be. Um, the caller brought up radio waves. Well, you know, as as awkward as it might be. I would say that uh, you know several hundred years ago when we did not know about radio waves it would have been foolish to believe in radio waves. Before you have evidence that a thing exists it is completely pointless to have a belief in the existence of that thing. 
now that we know that there are radio waves, now it's foolish not to believe in the existence of radio waves. So I mean, the, only, the only information we have about the universe is the way the universe appears to be. And if you don't go with what the evidence is, and you start believing in stuff for which there is no evidence, then you're making a mistake. Even if later, you know, there's some chance, some slim chance that you were right, in spite of the fact that there was no evidence, and later it turns out, well, in that case, you lucked out, and you were right about that thing that existed, even though there wasn't a scrap of evidence. You were still wrong uh, in the, you know, an intellectual sense. You were still wrong to latch on to a belief in that before the evidence was in. All right, and then Don's. Uh, you had something? Well, yes. Uh, the Bob was uh, was talking about Mark Twain, and yes, that uh, right. uh, atheists latch on to Mark Twain as a hero, and Mark Twain is one of my heroes. Uh, I would be careful about claiming that he was an atheist, although some atheists say yes, he was. Uh, I have not been able to find a quote that 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 just nails that down. What Mark Twain did, was and did was he uh, he felt strongly that a lot of our tri a traditional religion was mistaken and it was cruel. And he, in some of, the, the, some of his writings, makes that crystal clear, most of which, most of these were published after his death because he was afraid to publish them during his lifetime. We have other heroes that, uh, uh, that we admire very much who were not atheists, and one that jumps immediately to mind is Thomas Paine, who published Age of Reason, which, which was the first real uh, slam against uh, uh, Christianity that I can recall. And in it, he makes a big case for his religion, which is deism. Right. Uh, Thomas, I would say that Thomas Paine and, and Mark Twain were uh, in the class of people that we would call free thinkers. Uh, I wouldn't say, I, w I, would not be, be, I would not be able to accurately declare that they were atheists, but I will keep them as heroes because they were people that questioned. They were people that uh, uh, did not attach themselves to dogma and uh, felt it was okay to question uh, so-called sacred values. All right, fantastic. And uh, uh, just remind all the call, uh, we got a bunch of callers backed up here. We're going to try to get as many as we can on today. And Robert and Tim and Kim, stay on. We're going to go on to Daniel. Hey, guys. How's it going? Morning, fantastic. Daniel. All, all right. Good. Enjoying the program. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to make mine uh, short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm uh, currently at ACC as a writing student, and I'm taking a creative writing course over there, which, of course, we can write on a bevy of topics, whatever we choose. Well, suddenly the instructor has developed a two-week course in these the semi-Christian studies that's going to be implemented into the class now, uh, which has suddenly turned this uh, creative writing uh, project of ours. Now he's, he's saying that, uh, you know, the study of the Bible that he's going to do for the supposed two weeks is supposed to enhance our creativity in terms of <laughs> writing. Uh, I've never been a part of anything like this. I've taken writing classes at other institutions. I'm uh, kind of wondering what y'all think of, of that being inserted into curriculum, uh, you know, in, in terms of something like that. Well, the, my first thought is, what it, are, are, do you have to write something positive about the Bible? If you wrote something negative about the Bible, are you going to get... Uh, a lower grade? Hello? Hello? Did, did we lose the caller? We're getting some weird noises. Caller? Uh, we must have I lost guess we the lost call the caller. But it, uh, yeah, to me it seemed like a backdoor way of trying to get religion into the class. Uh, but he sounds like he's, he, uh, he's watching his step legally, whoever the teacher is. I'm using he. And, uh, whoever that particular teacher is. Uh, if they bring it in under the guise as fiction, and, and uh, you know, as a writing class, I don't see how you could avoid it's the, not a public know, school. And ACC is not a public school? I thought that it was. supported by the city of Austin. Uh, I thought it was. Right. Uh, my floor manager is saying it's not a public school, and I thought it was. Uh, let's go on down the line here to uh, Tim. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing, Tim? Oh, hanging in there. <laughs> I recognize the voice. Yep, I want to go back to the radio waves thing. Okay. That was a trick sure. little quagmire y'all were stepping into there. Okay. Um, so. Let's if you're going to say go on empirical evidence only, but you're glad somebody didn't, um, there's a whole plethora of things that relate to that. I mean, like mental telepathy waves, picking up brain waves that we didn't think existed and possible. And still don't. And they, they've never been proven. Uh, exactly. This is my point. <laughs> yeah. Just like radio waves, if you go on empirical data, we... We would be, we'll be stuck there. That's man's next part no, of evolution. No, Tim, no. that's not correct. It's perfectly okay to experiment 
you to have a to have a theory that wow this thing might exist let's check into it right and go ahead and have an experiment and see if you can if you can generate some evidence of the existence of that thing that's perfectly okay there's nothing wrong with that and they that, but that's not the same as believing that it exists and they spent years trying to prove uh, telepathic way you know these telepathic ways and have not been able to duplicate at, under scientific conditions any test that would actually prove those. Uh, They've come real close in several chances. And, then, yeah, and, and then these gentlemen back you know, in the 1850s or whatever else when they was started experimenting with uh, electricity came up with different formulas uh, not knowing how correct they really were and they just had ideas and then uh, once they had the theories then they came up with experiments and everything else that would actually prove and reinforce those theories. Sure, so it and, but it to discount all, all the other, you know, the paranormal stuff that you guys know I love. No. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things no. that I think we will prove and that things that have been proven but just aren't commonly known by the public. But um, there's fine. a lot of psychic stuff where, you know, people have, you know, done things that are numerologically impossible. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. Brain waves are measurable and um, thought transfer, you know, that's our next progress. Well, well how do you know that, Tim? Well, that's the only how, place how there is to go. We pretty that much that burn out all the empirical stuff. Oh, but, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, the, the, see, the problem is that is that uh, psi research is dominated by people who have gone about their approach to knowledge backward. They have decided that they believe in this stuff first and then gone out to get the evidence, which is exactly the wrong way you do things in science. You don't believe that that there are mental waves first, and then set up experiments to find them. Well, we know they're mental. That, we no, know they're brain waves. Let me finish, Tim. When you do that, it is all too easy, and and has it has occurred in many documented cases for the researchers to bias their experiments so that they get results that look like it proves something. Okay, that is unfortunately most of what is going on in psi research, and then. Scientists that do not have the bias in favor of belief in these things go back and examine the experiments and say, well, look, here you, here you cooked the data to make it look like you were getting a result that was meaningful. You threw out all the tests where you didn't get results that you could interpret as, as meaningful, and you're only looking at the positives. Well, that's just illegal. You can't do that. If you, if you don't look at all the evidence, you're not getting a clear picture. Um, and, and that's why, to date, the mainstream science still rejects the, the concept of, of mental telepathy because the few experiments that seem to have been positive have also turned out to be uh, misconstructed uh, and biased. And, uh, and Tim, I'm glad you called it. Uh, uh, it's been pointed out to me that uh, nowhere in the Bible is the word million. Aren't you the one who keeps bringing up that 200 million? Oh, Revelation, where the kings of the east, yeah, there's, it's clearly in there, it's 200,000, thousand. They don't say the word million, no, it says the exact number, oh, well, 200,000, you, thousand. You'd use uh, million, uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. why it was such an incredible prophecy, because they couldn't even conceptualize 200 million people being anywhere. Okay, it, I, I, I just wanted to point that out to you, because they're saying thousand, thousand. Right. 200,000, thousand. Yeah, whatever that thousands comes out to a million, but it comes out to 200 million. A thousand thousand would be a million, but it, right. I'm trying to figure out, uh, I might do the research now and find out if they do a thousand thousand. <laughs> yeah, it's in there, trust me. Okay, uh, all right. All right, quickly, anything else? No, that's it, thanks. All right, you have a great week. Bye. Thanks for calling, Tim. And uh, since we're doing all this talk about science and religion, I thought this might be a good time. Yeah, are you ready for this? Hey, well, if you want me to, I mean, I could do this any time. we got sure. a lot of callers on the line. Yeah. Okay, and I'll do either, it. Either way. Um, uh, we've talked about this several times. Keeps yeah, out. we yeah. frequently get callers claiming that um, that uh, that Albert Einstein believed in God in the same sense that they do and therefore um, they use uh, Einstein as evidence that their own beliefs are correct. Here is an article written by Albert Einstein for the New York Times Magazine. It appeared on November 1930, page 1 to 4, and a German version was also published in Germany on November 11. Uh, and this is what Einstein had to say on, in his article called Religion and Science. Everything that the human race has done and thought is concerned with the satisfaction of deeply felt needs and the assuagement of pain. One has to keep this constantly in mind if one wishes to understand spiritual movements and their development. Feeling and longing are the motive force behind all human endeavor and human creation in however exalted a guise the latter may present themselves to us. 
Now, what are the feelings and needs that have led men to religious thought and belief in the widest sense of the words? A little consideration will suffice to show us that the most varying emotions preside over the birth of religious thought and experience. With primitive man, it is above all fear that evokes religious notions, fear of hunger, wild beasts, sickness, death. Since at this stage of existence, understanding of causal connections is usually poorly developed, the human mind creates illusory beings more or less analogous to itself on whose wills and actions these fearful uh, uh, happenings depend. Thus one tries to secure the favor of these beings by carrying out actions and offering sacrifices which, according to the tradition handed down from generation to generation, propitiate them or make them well disposed toward a, a mortal. In this sense, I am speaking of a religion of fear. This is, an important, uh, is in an important degree stabilized by the formation of a priestly class which sets itself up as a mediator between the people and the beings they fear and erects a hegemony on this basis. In many cases, a leader or ruler of a privileged class whose position rests on other factors combines priestly functions with its sexual, secular authority <laughs> in order to make the latter more secure, or the political rulers and the priestly caste make common cause in their own interests. The social impulses are another source of the crystallization of religion. Fathers and mothers and the leaders of larger human communities are mortal and fallible. The desire for guidance, love, and support prompts men to form the social or moral conception of God. This is the God of providence, who protects, disposes, rewards, and punishes. The God who, according to the limits of the believer's outlook, loves and cherish cherishes the life of the tribe or of the human race, race or even life itself. The comforter in sorrow and unsatisfied longing, he who preserves the souls of the dead. This is the social or moral conception of God. Thus we arrive at a conception of the relation of science to religion, very different from the usual one. When one views the matter historically, one is inclined to look upon science and religion as irreconcilable antagonists, and for, the very, uh, for a very obvious reason. The man who is thoroughly convinced of the universal operation of the law of causation cannot for a moment entertain the idea of a being who interferes in the course of events, provided, of course, that he takes the hypothesis of causa causality really seriously. He has no use for the religion of fear, and equally little for the social or moral religion. A God who rewards and punishes is inconceivable to him for the simple reason that a man's actions are determined by necessity, external and internal, so that in God's eyes he cannot be responsible any more than an inanimate object is responsible for the motions it undergoes. Science has therefore been charged with undermining morality, but the charge is unjust. A man's ethical behavior should be based effectually on sympathy, education, and society's needs. No religious basis is necessary. Man would indeed be in a poor way if he had to restr be restrained by fear of punishment and hope of reward after death. So that's, that's uh, Albert Einstein's comments From on religion words. and God. Now, yeah. again, we want to we uh, point out uh, Albert Einstein was not necessarily an atheist in the traditional sense either. Albert Einstein believed in Spinoza's God, which is more of a attitude about what uh, an attitude about the universe that the universe is really big and neat and worthy of awe and uh, and uh, and a certain emotional reaction, but not God in the sense of some sort of being who. Uh, cares much about what we do in our daily lives. All right. And, uh, just remind everyone, we are live April 18th. This show is brought to you by Atheist Community of Austin. Uh, remind all the callers, just hang on. We will get to you there. And I guess Kim is next in line. Kim? Hi. Good morning. So I hope you won't hang up on me this week. I'll try not to. <laughs> okay. Back to what Carl Sagan said. Let me turn my volume down. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, he was talking about delusion. He said, just, okay, and my question is for this, just because it was a delusion for him doesn't mean it, you know, it is a delusion for us who do believe and have the atheists experienced, have they not experienced God because they haven't truly seeked him? That's my question, because you have like the atheist experience. Well, being looking at experience in the dictionary, it's an event or series of events participated in or lived through. So, All right. 
I mean, I'm just thinking, not, you know, last week you hung up and you said, you know, I was Christian BS, but, and I don't do that to you. I never say atheist. I never said, you know, I, if I, I remember right, uh, the question was about uh, the show or whatever else, and I was talking about all the Christian BS that's on the show. I, yeah, I apologize if you took offense at that particular statement. I was not directed towards you. We don't we don't ca hang up on anybody unless we the argument gets too heated and and we have trouble responding to the points raised by the caller. So as long as we take turns and respond to each other, that that's fine. Well, there's always three of you and one of me. Yeah. So what do you think about this message from God? I've been wanting to get a Christian point of view on this. What, I haven't seen that. What is that? Uh, this is the Weekly World News. Supposedly, uh, two years ago, uh, NASA received this message on a radio telescope. It took them two years to decipher it, but they had determined it's a message from God. And, uh, so yeah, you, but look, I mean, look where it's coming from. Is that like an inquirer or something? Yes, yeah. exactly. I mean... That's, I mean, so, I mean, we don't, you can't go by that, but I'm just no, saying. But my point is, uh, what do you think, uh, do you think God, your God, to, uh, would actually use NASA to uh, communicate his message to the world? Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, he could, I mean, he could do anything if he wanted to send his message any which way, but I believe if he's going to, when he does send his message, it'll be in the sky for everybody to see, like he says. I mean, if it, if it it'll all. Be in is, the sky. In the, yeah, if it comes true to pass. But, oh. yeah, because he'll appear in the sky at the very end. I mean, but back to what Carl Sagan said. Okay, because, sure. Because, I mean, that, I don't want to get heated and get, you know, get okay. all off into something. But he's talking about delusion just because it was a delusion for him. And he's saying it's kind of uh, wasting our time to believe in something. You know, we have, like, okay, me personally. Okay, I have it. I used to be atheist because I used to didn't believe. So I So what event changed your mind there? What what I had a true experience where he talked to me. I mean, he you told me. You actually talked to God. Yes, ex absolutely. I mean, in, I had to. How do you know be, it was God? Did excuse you, me. Did, how do you know that it was God? I mean, if you <clears throat> well, if you accept the existence that there are supernatural beings out there that you can't see, but that well, apparently can you, talk to you, then how do you know that it was not uh, uh, Satan? I mean, did you did you ask because, for ID? I mean, because it lined up with it. Because what he told me and what he put me, you know, ex, what the experience I had lined up with the Bible. Okay. You, so know, you know what I'm saying? If it was from Satan, that, yeah. but if it would have been evil, it would have been something wrong and bad. But he sent me something good and wonderful. I mean, it's almost like experiencing a child. I mean, if you've had a child, especially being a woman. You experience this birth, and and you go through this, and you and it's amazing. You go, wow, that's a neat experience. So I believe in birth. Can, can I respond? <laughs> you to know, that? I believe that that's that's. I, I'm glad you do. Yeah, I believe I, in birth. It, you I know, believe I was. You know, some it was the evidence. evidence. Yeah, there is some physical evidence. I mean, there's some physical evidence, and I actually had some physical evidence, and I guess that's what it took for me. Because you had I physical did. evidence of your God experience. Yes, with me, I did absolutely. What, what's Be that physical experience? Well. I mean, that's personal, but I mean, well, you personal. just have to trust me, and that's, but I seeked him, and he showed me physically through, you know, in, in my, you know, audible head with words and uh, experiences. I mean, no, but it's like you, you believe in atheists, right? You believe in the atheist community because you've experienced it. And what made you believe in atheists? Okay, well, oh, the, uh, boy, there are so many things to respond to. Let's, let's get back <laughs> to your original point. Um, when Carl Sagan uses, Sagan uses the word delusion, okay, he does not mean um, uh, that that anything that that any idea that anybody has in their head is just a delusion and therefore isn't worthy of belief, okay. The, whether a idea you have in your head is worthy of belief, from Carl Sagan's point of view, which I happen to agree with, whether an idea in your head is worthy of belief depends on whether that idea is supported by physical. Uh, objective evidence that exists outside of yourself where anybody who wants to can come along and take a look at the evidence and evaluate it and reach the same conclusion you did. Okay? If, if there is physical evidence but you reach some kind of wacky conclusion that is not obvious to anybody else, or if there is no evidence whatsoever and you go ahead believing it, Carl Sagan would label that a delusion. <coughs> All right. no, but that's like a, I mean it wasn't an acid trip, I mean that would be a delusion. I mean, um, uh, you know, an acid trip. How, how can, but how can we tell the difference? If you come to us with a story that you... Oh, well, yeah, that's right. That, you're absolutely right, but that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> you can't say that <clears throat> that's a delusion for me because 
you haven't experienced what we, I experienced, can, but it, you, unless you can unless you can provide us. Uh, evidence out, from outside of your head. The only okay? way I can. I mean, physical evidence of the existence of a supernatural being, or, or e even uh, you know, statistical evidence from science, or, or or something. Okay, something that comes from outside of just your imagination. Unless you can provide us with that, then you, your belief in the feelings that you have just in your head is a delusion and and by and definition. I'm, and and I want to go back to what I've always said last time. But I, it, I think you truly haven't experienced him because you haven't truly seeked him. Okay. If, I, if I truly sought God, <laughs> ma'am, if I truly sought God and I had the same emotional experience you had, okay, the same personal, just in my head experience you had, right. I would be suffering from a delusion because I should not believe that unless there is, besides my personal feelings, evidence, tangible, objective evidence in the world well, besides my personal feelings to back that up. And then the point I was going to make was, we, is if you said those voices were anything else but God, if they were saying that, they would say you were schizophrenic. And, uh, and the schizophrenic has their own reality and their own world, and uh, they're going to try yeah. to convince me that that world is just as real to, as yours. You know, so. Well, I mean, schizophrenic is voices that don't make sense, I think. If it's schizophrenic is like, you, you know, God sense. tells you well, things. But you, said your voices, you said your voices uh, agreed with the Bible. And it was and, physical. And, and we're, we're, we'll sit here and tell you that the Bible doesn't make sense. Yeah, so but that, you don't that know. I mean, I can't thing. tell you what you physically experienced in your atheist belief, and I can't tell you what you physically experience in your, there is you nothing, know. There is nothing to physically experience in our atheist belief. Atheism is the default position that you have to take if you don't have, a, that, that you, it is the de default position you are in if you do not believe in any gods. We don't believe in any gods because there is no tangible, objective uh, evidence of the existence of any well, gods. Well, I mean, to me, though, I mean, and we go back to the same thing uh, we always do, but the tangible experience is look outside. No, that's not either. I mean, that's, okay, that's my <laughs> belief, though. That's my Heck. belief. <laughs> you have a I mean, yeah, and, and having air. a child, I mean, that was a, that was a belief, too. But right. then you get confirmation. I mean, if you want to get confirmation in anything, you need to seek it, search it, I mean, to the, to the highest point. I'd like point. to address that. Uh, and, and, you, I, you have, and I'm not trying to be rude, Kim, but i got a bunch of other calls. No, yeah, I understand. Can I go? Kim, I, I, you, I, you have a great week. You too. I, 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 I really accept, Kim, that, that, uh, that you, you believe what you say you believe. But I think it's very clear in, in uh, listening to you that, you that this is something that you really, really want to believe, that you have sought after God with the idea in your mind that this is, this is really something that you uh, uh, were seeking you know, confirmation of, not like you were testing the idea to see if it was really true or not. And, and, and your beliefs are fine with me. You have and, uh, no problem with it. And with then that. Arlo? No, it's Vic? not Arlo. This is Vic. Vic? I'm sorry, Vic. Hey, Vic. Go ahead, Vic. Um, well, I get that all the time where she says, you know, people tell you, uh, well, you want to see God, just take a look outside, look around you. How could this all be here? But I have another quote from Diderot that kind of relates to that. And it says, miracles of which only a few are said to have been witnesses are insufficient to prove that the truth of a religion that ought to be believed by the whole world. Excellent quote. And Excellent. Uh, uh, also, the, uh, the, 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 Kim was talking about religious experience. And uh, uh, there was a, a famous author who pointed out, and I can't recall his name right now, but uh, who pointed out that, that religious experience is only religious experience for the person experiencing it. To everybody else, it's hearsay. <laughs> there you go. Um, it, there's something, something else uh, she was now implying. Now, this is Arlo. <laughs> yeah, this is really Arlo. <laughs> okay. Something she was implying that there, are, there aren't, as if there aren't any atheists who have sought God. I mean, I have a friend who I knew her when she did believe in God, and she, there were times when she told me she believed she had a discussion with God even at her workplace sometimes. Now she's an atheist. She doesn't believe that anymore. So uh, apparently there are some uh, atheists that go back on what they used to believe. And uh, for all you know, you may find yourself in that position one day too. And, and even if we were just to look at this statistically, most of the people in the world are not Christians. And, uh, but it, and that's only like taking out roughly 20% of people who are non-believers or atheists, okay? So 80 per, of 80% 80 of the world's population, less than half of that are Christians. And that means there are huge numbers of people who feel that they have a justification for their religious beliefs who do not reach the same conclusion that Christians do. And 
so what, what's going on here? Either we pick the biggest religion and say, well, that's the one that's really true, um, which is what Christians that's would right. like to do, or I would suggest yeah. more uh, reasonably what you do is you realize that uh, there are psychological things going on and people in their heads reach different conclusions and none of that is indication of any kind of fundamental truth. And then uh, Kellen had a point? Yeah. That's um, Kellen Von Hauser. Actually, I'm a, I'm a social worker and I work with uh, schizophrenics and they hear voices that tell them that they're God or the devil and the voices do make sense and they do have messages and we give a medication and it goes away. <laughs> um, <it's laughs> so there's hope. There's hope, <laughs> but I, I've also seen a, a lot of uh, um, um, experimentation with uh, uh, seizure patients, and uh, seizure patients who have seizures in the temporal lobe um, have that God experience that someone else is in the room, or they describe experiencing angels or devils or um, the tunnel and the white light, the whole near-death experience. All of that can be reproduced by stimulating the temporal lobe. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for the input there. It reminds me of a poem I once heard in uh, sure. middle school. Uh, Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm a schizophrenic and so am I. <laughs> well, I like that. We, do, we don't mean to imply <laughs> that, the, that the caller Kim is a schizophrenic no. exactly. or, that, no. or that the vast majority of Christians who believe that they have heard the, wor the voice of God are schizophrenics. But what we do mean to indicate is that there's all kinds of stuff going on in the brain and we cannot safely conclude that everything we experience in our heads is automatically uh, worthy of belief. Okay. We've, got to be, we've got to look outside of ourselves for physical confirmation of those beliefs, otherwise that's a delusion. And if I may confess, when I was young I used to think I was being abducted by UFOs and crap like that. <laughs> Alright, let's go back to the callers here and we'll try to get as many as we can here. Joe? Joe? Morning, guys. How y'all doing? Fantastic. Great. Um, hey, I was wanting to I was wanting to let y'all know that I've been watching y'all show for a very long time, and uh, I'm atheist who was once uh, under the delusion of Christianity and stuff. So, um, have y'all seen The Matrix? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it good? Darn good movie. Y'all have seen it? Oh, yeah, okay. has. I haven't seen I guess it. I'm the only okay. one here. Um, I've heard you, good reviews. Did you ever about notice it. the? Uh, I was wanting to discuss if you noticed the um, the religious overtones that were pretty much built into the movie about the Matrix. Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting. I didn't notice that, uh, but I did notice that in the Truman Show. So I guess yes. I wasn't on my toes when I was watching <laughs> the Matrix. My wife, who also watched the Matrix, brought that up, and I said, gosh, yeah, you're right. There seems to be a, a, a big theme going on in Hollywood, and I'm, I'm just waiting until the fundamentalists start rising up in anger against this, the way they, they, they rose up against, you know, the, the perception of communism in Hollywood back in the 50s. But uh, there does seem to be, uh, do seem to be a lot of films coming out now where um, there's sort of a, a, an analog of the concept of God versus humanity brought up and that's explored and God turns out to be like the bad guy and it's the humans and their, uh, their own um, integrity that that turn out to be the heroes. Interesting. Yeah, was that, was that, was that your really impression of the Matrix? What's that? Was that the impression you got of the Matrix? Well, see, actually, I saw it twice. I saw it last Sunday with a bunch of friends of mine, and then um, on Thursday, or, or actually Friday, um, my girlfriend and me went to go see it because she hadn't seen it, and she she's Gnostic, and uh, and she's the one that pointed that out, mm -hmm. which is I thought it was kind of funny because how your wife pointed out pointed out those kind of uh, overtones. Yeah. Uh, I mean, especially, and, and after thinking about it, it was really interesting, especially considering when uh, um, <clears throat> when they had Morpheus tied, tied up and, and Smith told him how the Matrix tried to create the perfect world, but that didn't happen, which he, after right. thinking about it, Garden of Eden. Right. But humans humans uh, thrive on misery, and that's why it ended up ended up coming out that way. And there's a whole lot of stuff that, if you really think about it, I mean, could be just coincidence or whatever. But I just kind of wanted to bring that up because it was really interesting after we discussed it on the way home and stuff. I so. see it now. Yeah, I, 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 Joe, have me more interested. And yeah. Maybe want to go and watch it. Yeah. Have you ever seen uh, uh, Life of Brian? The Life of Brian, yeah. Okay. Oh, Don't yeah. you love it? Oh, I loved it. I've seen that movie many times. It's great. I thought that. That's that's a wonderful movie. We uh, we usually have a party every every year and uh, go to somebody's house and watch Life with Brian. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, that's it's a hoot. Good. It's really good. 
Yeah, I hadn't seen that in a while. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you all, and uh, have a good weekend. Okay, thanks, Joe. Thanks for calling. Bye. Oh, let me let me throw this in, too, about the Matrix. It's, uh, it's also, I mean, the basic premise is that um, reality is really a computer simulation. Right. And then there's a real, real world. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, what's neat in the Matrix is that, is that um, there's, there's evidence in the virtual reality that it's just a virtual reality. And people figured it out. And that's how they managed to escape. And uh, it's a very pro-science message in spite of the fact that they use the fact that you're in a virtual reality to allow all kinds of supernatural sort of things to happen. Uh -huh. Well, that's because it's just a simulation. It doesn't have to obey laws. <laughs> and okay. when you find out it's not obeying laws, well, wow, if it's not obeying real solid laws, that means it's not a real solid universe. And there must be a real, you know, higher level reality that we can yeah. get to where the real physical laws hold sway. A, a new cool. explanation for hearing the voice of God. There you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Arlo. Remind everyone, this is April 18th. This show is being brought to you by Atheist Community of Austin. And today we're going to be doing the safe walk. So I just wanted to point that out again about the safe walk. Uh, Let's talk about that for just a second. So go right ahead, Doug. Uh, safe Place is a, an organization that was created by combining uh, the Rape Crisis Center and the Battered Women's Center into one organization. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, they do good work. They help people survive uh, uh, violence, domestic violence, and not domestic violence. And they're having a walk today to, to raise funds. Uh, I think it starts in Wooldridge Park at uh, 2 o'clock or so. There'll be some speakers before that. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a great bunch. Uh, and if you want, come out and walk and maybe give them some money. Uh, maybe. I mean, if you, if you uh, think that this is a, a uh, cause worth uh, uh, participating in. So some of us will be out there. Thank you. Yeah, just wanted to remind everyone. Uh, let's try another, uh, another call here. Uh, Robert? Good morning, Yo. Robert. Yo, what's up, man? Am I on? Yes, you are. All right. Um, Quickly. i got to tell you guys, you got a really good show, man. I've never seen this before, man. Thank you. It's and not I'm, on anywhere else. I don't like the way you tell it like it is. You know, you laid everything on the line, and you tell them how well hung I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Yes. Hey. It's true, folks. Robert is humongous. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Arlo. You want to take a break here with us? Oh, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> uh, I, this is from the Austin American Statesman. I can't uh, tell you what day because I didn't write that down, but uh, i got to give them credit for it. And uh, this is about a campaign for uh, Bible reading. Campaign boosts Bible as cool read. It was quite a holy coterie. Gospel singers, tap dancers, and Pat Robertson introducing a cooler Bible. In what is being billed as the largest Bible reading campaign in the history of America, the television preacher hit the stage Wednesday at Grand Central Terminal in New York. We want to make the Bible reading cool in America, said Robertson, introduced by actress Lynn Whitfield as strobe lights flashed across the ceiling of the station's Vanderbilt Hall. TV ads for The Book in both a hip-hop and a country-western version feature Smokey Robinson, MC Hammer, Chaka Khan, Andrea, Sandra Crouch, Charlie Daniels, and Naomi Judd. The ad campaign is costing $7 million. The book is published and promoted by the Christian Broadcasting Network and Tyndale House Publishers Incorporated. Well, as an atheist, I would just like to say that I In support uh, efforts uh, to get people to read the Bible. I think people should read the Bible. And when they do, there, there's going to be some interesting things that they find in there. Uh, they're going to find that in Luke 3.23, it says that uh, Heli, I guess, H-E-L-I, is uh, Jesus' grandfather, the father of Joseph. And in Matthew 1.16, it said Jacob was Jesus' grandfather. So since that's contradictory, I guess it can't all be true. I, yeah, well, Somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 19.12 recommends self-castration. Matthew 5.39 in that famous verse about turning the other cheek says that we should resist not evil, which I have a problem with. Uh, Matthew 10.34 says that uh, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to bring peace but a sword. Uh, for Luke 14.26 uh, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and children and brethren and uh, sisters, and, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. There's a family value for you. <laughs> Luke 20, 22, 36. He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Uh, in uh, 
four four different places Matthew 16 28 Matthew 24 verse 33 34 uh, Mark uh, 9 1 Luke 21 32 uh, those passages all say that uh, Jesus will return within this generation so look it up and then uh, two that are my favorites uh, Mark 16 verses 17 and 18 and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. There's a testable proposition. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Okay? And then uh, uh, my all-time favorite, Luke 19.27, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Read your Bible. Arlo? Oh, well, that, and I just remember from something I read last night, which I do happen to know the verse and chapter, uh, Deuteronomy 21, I think, verse uh, 16 through 17. It says that if a woman shall uh, touch uh, the privates of another man other than her husband, you are to cut off her arm and, I mean, cut off her hand and do not feel pity for her. <laughs> and so it's good. not just the Quran. I've heard Christians yeah. say, oh, the Quran tells you to cut off someone's hand for stealing. Well, apparently it's in the Old Testament, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah, we're pretty strict. Yeah, we we definitely advocate you out there. You read your Bible with an open mind, and you'll be amazed. And uh, and then like that X-rated Bible, you'll be amazed th that you're actually having your kids read all this stuff. There's <laughs> stuff in there you never imagined. That, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. Read all right. It. So uh, let's go on down to uh, George. Yeah, um, I'm I'm glad you did say read your Bible. I think that's good advice, and uh, I, I guess. Uh, some people can read it and and uh, not see uh, you know what some of us would consider the truth and uh, I, I think you you, you read uh, you're, you're quoting scripture there that what that last guy just said about cutting off your arm I've never read that so I'd sure like to know where that's at but Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 21 uh, verse uh, 16 through 17 there you go okay I'll look that up. Uh, but I did, you know, you did, you did cite these other references and about hating uh, your parents. Uh, that's in comparison to God, and that's the, that's just the way He wants it. Uh, and and then uh, get a sword. You know, there are some things worth fighting for, some things worth dying for. So that's why uh, that's in there. I don't know why you ridicule that. Uh, but you're talking about the because Matrix movie, be, and we we think there's too much violence and hatred going on right now. There are so many armed conflicts going on because of religion right now. Mm -hmm. that we think peace is a whole lot better choice than well, go out there and well, slay your enemies is uh, amazing. Why would well, you want to follow uh, a, an entity that told you that, uh, that uh, you should love it and hate everything else? Uh, Why would you want to follow no, no, that? No, That's God, Jesus has told us to love our neighbor as ourselves, and that would include everybody. Uh, and but so he also said, he uh, but, not, but not as much as God. But not as much as God. If God told you to, well, the Abraham story about God telling a father to kill his own son. Yeah. If God tells you to do that. Why would you worship that? Well, uh, it's because he's God. He made us. And, and, uh, so, so you believe you believe that might makes right? I believe God makes right. And and, he just, and why does God make right? Why did, What gives God the authority to make us. right? He made he made you, and he, he'll take you out when he feels. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know. So it's so it's God's power over us that you think justifies His demand to be in charge of everything. He's uh, yeah. Well, it's the fact that He is in charge of everything. It's just recognizing that fact is is is, is all it is. Uh, jo George, know, I have a, I have a question for you. Are you saying that whatever God wants is right? That's right. Okay, and that that's the only way something gets to be right or wrong is. That's right. That's okay. Right. So I'm, right and wrong have no independent meaning other than what what God wants. Right. And if and if God desires that you uh, uh, torture children or do something that we would think is just terribly evil, that would be good in your eyes because God wants you to do it. If He did want us to do that, but He well, you know, that's an excellent point. Sacrifice the firstborn. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, uh, He's never asked us to sacrifice our firstborn. That's you just what talked the, about Abraham. People like you guys said that God asked Abraham to kill his child, and but, Abraham was fully prepared to do something. But he didn't have to do it, now, did he? God, God, you know, <laughs> because God he heard those end. voices that told him not to at the last minute there, yes. <laughs> no, it's guys like you that have advocated killing your firstborn, guys that don't believe in God. No, I don't When know. did we ever do that, sir? Think I've ever well, done that. how about uh, what, uh, Ramses or, or uh, the king of Egypt? Uh, 
I killed all the firstborn of. Uh, um, and he no, was, your God. No. Well, he, well, and he, he wasn't Egypt, an atheist. In Egypt, it was your God that killed all the Egyptian firstborn. Well, that's true. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you worship this thing. Yeah. You worship this thing that you think goes around killing babies when it, it has to make a point. He, and he, he makes he make he killed his own son. He allowed his own son to be nailed. Yeah, to that's just nuts. <laughs> well, apparently, and I think was the, not I think an atheist. Message, I don't. I think the yeah, message there from God is that the life is not is is not all encompassing like we think it is because it's all we know, and that there is an afterlife and it's not something to be feared to go off into the afterlife, and so our life perishes. It's, the Bible says it's like a wisp of uh, smoke and time. It just, so what are you waiting for? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clinging to it, or at least I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get myself in a mindset of not clinging to life and that everything here is just the end of all things, that there are higher truths and uh, higher ideals than just feeding myself and procreating. I think Arlo yeah. had a point or something. Oh, it's pointless now. No. <laughs> I, mention, okay. I, mean, I was going to mention Sir, the parts where Sir, incest. Go ahead, Arlo. I was going to mention the parts where incest can be justified, but I don't think that matters really. That hasn't well. been justified from the very first generations. You know, when there was nobody else to. Uh, well, pro the point I was going to make then, if you're, you're if you're that convinced that this this Bible here is determined your right and wrong. Uh, how come you don't have any slaves? It does not say anywhere in the Bible any prohibition is against slave. It actually gives you in there instructions on how to treat your slave, it how to mark kindly, your slave. It says to be kindly to your, tr your slaves. It says in Jesus Christ we are all free. It says to beat them, but not to a point to where they die. And of course, it's for the slave master's benefit. I, I don't know where it says that. It says to be good to you. You know, it says to love your. Jesus' last instructions were to love your neighbors yourself. But you can, his, you his, his neighbor was anyone in his tribe. If you did not belong to that particular tribe, no. you're not considered a neighbor. He loved. He loved. The, he loved the people that was killing him on the cross. He said, "God forgive these people. They don't even know what they're doing. They weren't part of the tribe. They were Roman soldiers." And and I, I agree with you that what we, that we should live slavery? in peace. And, and I what? but but your definition look, of peace. All, look, the entire the, your your worship of God is all about slavery, right? You no. are a slave to God. You well, entirely I'm, belong to God. You will do whatever you think God tells you to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're a slave. You have no you have no conception of right and wrong of your own. You have no uh you have no objectives goals um you know ego of your own. You are a nothing. That's what you believe. It right, uh, uh, and and you're ridiculously dangerous. Why, because, why am I dangerous? Because you're going to go off and do whatever some religious leader can convince you your God wants you to do. Yeah, I'd, I'd like that's to, just that's just frightening. I, I would like to address why I think. Uh, I mean, you you uh, we're talking to George, right? Yeah. Uh, George, you sound like a nice guy, but uh, let me tell you why I think that. Uh, uh, religious belief to the, in, in exact, using exactly the words that you described is scary to me. A few years ago, we had a uh, uh, Pat Robertson was running for for president. You remember that? Yeah, sure. Okay, and Pat Robertson has stated that uh, he believes that the the world will end in a nuclear conflagra conflagration, and that it's God's will, and that. He kind of saw himself playing a role in that. Now, to me, to have that guy with his finger on the nuclear button is very scary. Uh, and it's, you know, if he didn't say he was going to cause the nuclear. Con he no, he but he sure it. wasn't going to try. Just real hard to avoid it. I mean, I, he, th I he thought it. He see, to me, the end of the world in nuclear war is a bad thing. But I for agree. you, it might not be. Now, that's that's a, that's a pretty big gulf. No, now, no, no. Now that's that's on the on a large scale with somebody that would have a whole lot of physical power. Uh, if you're uh, driving behind me in your car and you think God wants you to kill me, then uh, you know you you're gonna do that, right? I mean, you're gonna obey God's will, right? But I'm trying to tell you, God's last words to us were to love our neighbor. Now, I don't know how, why are you afraid of that? That's uh, you know. Because we're not that, afraid of that. It's all the other things that are in your your holy book we, we, that you believe are God's will that who, frighten us. Who we, killed we Madeline had a show where we did where we had these lists of all the people. I think Earl did it. All the people I, that were killed. I did it. in the Bible. Oh, it, okay. it was one of your, it was one of the atheists that killed Madeline Murray O'Hare. Your your uh, founder. No, I don't. As a matter of fact, and I don't know where that where that stands. Well, but if see, that he was guy, on his staff. excuse me, if that guy that worked as an office manager at American Atheists is the one who cared, killed her, yes. he was not an atheist. 
Well, he wasn't a Christian because Christians don't believe in killing. I mean, other than... <laughs> well, well, these wow. Christians you kill do abortion believe in killing. Is, uh, you do believe in killing. No. You believe in killing whenever you think your God wants you to. God, God. Don't you? And George, I'm sorry. Uh, we're running out of time and we've got a bunch of other callers. Thank uh, you for the call, George. Uh, we I appreciate it. I do appreciate it. you call there. Have a yeah. good day. And you have a great week. Uh, let me remind everyone, too, that Earl Beach is going to be on next week, right? Yes. Is Earl yeah. on again? Yes. Earl, okay. uh, that is our... Uh, our group's Bible expert. And, uh, so, any of your Bible questions, or uh, definitely call in next week because he knows the Bible inside and out. He George, knows hold on. I, I want to say something to that last. Sure, caller. go right George, ahead. George, uh, you you seem to be abdicating any personal responsibility for deciding what is right and wrong by uh, by saying that right and wrong are dictated by your God and that you will you will just accept it, whatever you think your God thinks is right is right and whatever you think your God thinks is wrong is wrong. The problem is that at some point in your life you looked at the Bible and Christianity, hopefully, you looked at them and you decided, wow, this stuff really makes sense. Okay? And that means that at that point you were using your own in, internal personal exactly. sense of right and wrong and to, that to you that shouldn't to, you shouldn't abdicate that, okay? I, I don't think your God would want you to abdicate that if he existed. I think your God would want you to use the brains and the instincts yeah. that you've got. Look at the stuff that, uh, look very carefully whenever some religious leader tells you what they, or, or what your, some holy document uh, says that your God wants. Look very carefully and think very carefully and don't just do it because you believe, okay? That's all I'm asking. Mm -hmm. um, because if because otherwise you're just a pawn and you don't have any control over whether some guy's gonna gonna uh, feed you a line of religious stuff and and use you for some evil purpose. And uh, I, I'm debating on whether not to take any calls here. Uh, we're running out of some line. Oh darn! Just take one more. Come on. All right, and uh, we're running out of time. So if you don't get on the air, uh, apologize. Uh, our voicemail is three seven one two nine one one. Feel free to call it. All right, Fred, quickly. Hello? Fred, yes, go ahead, quickly. You're on the air, Fred. Uh, I cannot hear you through the phone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Quickly. Okay, uh, I'm hearing you through the TV. Uh, let me quickly point out something here, uh, just what was mentioned earlier about uh, we using our own brains and making our own reality. I believe this show, uh, and, and first of all, let me tell you, I'm an atheist myself. Um, this show's uh, main purpose, it seems like, is to influence people, educate people, uh, in uh, giving them more uh, insight into the reality of things the way they are from a scientific point of view. Um, however, uh, it seems like what we get into uh, many, uh, many a times, an argument uh, uh, that uh, goes into unatheist argument rather than atheist argument, I mean, untheist arguments. Uh, rather atheist arguments. Atheist basically means there is no God. However, untheist is where you are defying God or you're saying, well, God is not, uh, you know, what they define God to be as good or bad or what the God said in their Bible or in their Quran or in their uh, holy book uh, is, uh, is not evidence or is not this wow. or is not that. I think we are crossing over into areas. Um, and I'm going to have to let you go because I'm definitely running out of time. That was an excellent point you brought up, though. And please call back next week, Fred. All right? You have a great, you have a great week there. Uh, we're not leaving yet. Uh, just remind everyone, we're heading down to the Hot Jumble Bakery once we get done here. Uh, it's free and open to the public. And it, and say again? It's at West 5th and Lavaca. And Jeff had a point. Sorry. Oh, uh, just to respond to that last caller, um, uh, I... Uh, what the God in the Bible is um, credited with, what he is, what he is supposed to have done, uh, those may not be atheist arguments, but they certainly are things that we're going to notice when proponents of those religions come along and, and try to tell us this or that about their God. We're going to look at what their own holy book says their own God does, and we're going to make, uh, you know, we're going to make comments about that. And that's all that is. I, I like it. We're getting waved at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woohoo! Special effects. Uh, <laughs> that's actually oh, me and Don. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, going back and forth there. It's hard to tell.
We love you, Austin. Oh, that's fun.